everyone. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about building a carbon dioxide measuring device with embedded rust. And since I like to dig into stuff from right in the beginning and um, into very detail, I am making this into a story of how to turn an amount of molecules in the air into a human readable number. Who am I? My name is Franz Transfeld. My pronouns are they, them. I'm a former teacher for chemistry and art. And now I do embedded development and teach Rust at Ferris Systems. And you can find me on Twitter and GitHub under the name Mirabellensaft. I am also an organizer, organizer of Rustbridge Berlin. And we have, a, well, Rustbridge is an organization that helps marginalized people to learn Rust. And we have a workshop on November 23rd, and we still need coaches. So if you like teaching Rust, or even if you have never taught Rust but like to try it, I encourage you to sign up uh, as a coach. And yeah. <laughs> So back to the CO2 measuring device. The hardware I use is um, one sen a sensor from Sensoron the SCD30, which is a non-dispersive infrared carbon dioxide sensor. And we talk about, I, I will explain to you what that means. And which also measures temperature and humidity. Um, the microcontroller I use is a with DWM 1001 Dev Development Board, and also lots of wires and a breadboard. I will talk a bit about chemistry, but don't be afraid. The only two things you need to know beforehand is that matter is made out of atoms, and there is a spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. So, atoms bond together to form molecules. I have two examples. One is carbon dioxide, which is made out of two oxygen atoms and one carbon atom, and one water molecule, which is made out of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And the important part here is that molecules have geometry. Despite both of these having are made, of, are, made out, are made out of uh, three atoms. The one is in a line and the other one has an angle. The principle this sensor is built is actually pretty simple. We have a sample chamber with an opening where the ambient air can flow in and out. And at the one side there is an infrared source <coughs> The rays go down to a bandpass filter, which only lets through a um, specific wavelength, and they are passed to an inf a passive infrared sensor. Infrared radiation is on the spectrum of ele ele <laughs> sorry, electromagnetic radiation, uh, pretty much right outside of the spectrum of visible light. So oftentimes it's referred to as infrared, infrared light. And the wavelength that is most interesting for this type of sensor is the wavelength at one micrometer, which is indicated with the arrow. Yeah, infrared interacts with molecules. The molecules absorb energy and they start to vibrate. Uh, this is a carbon dioxide molecule showing the different kinds of vibrations it can do. And other than in this GIF, usually more than one type of vibration can appear at the same time in the same molecule. And additionally to that, molecules spin. So molecules are a very wobbly subject <laughs> and not static at all. 
So the substances increase in temperature as the vibrations of the single molecules dissipate as heat. <laughs> so the wavelength at which different types of molecules absorb infrared is characteristic. Each substance has a distinct profile. So you can see there are carbon dioxide has peaks here at 4.2 micrometers and here about two and a half. And back in the end between 14 and 16, it has some smaller peaks too. Um, and the profiles of other molecules look different. But these profiles are not completely unique. And for us, the overlap between carbon dioxide and water is very important. As you can see, this carbon dioxide peak almost shares the same peak with water. And as the height of the peak indicates the amount of the substance detected, um, water is a huge distraction when wanting to measure carbon dioxide with infrared. So, how do we deal, deal with that problem? The bandpass filter. This, um, the bandpass filter only lets spe specific wavelengths through. Transmission is the amount of electromagnet electromagnetic radiation that passes through something. The transmission for infrared through the filter goes up for the same wavelength where the transmission of infrared through carbon dioxide goes down. This way only infrared that could have been absorbed by carbon dioxide but was not ends up on the other side of the filter. And the wavelength at which water molecules absorb infrared too is basically shut out. So we got rid of the problem for now. How can this be used to count molecules? This is actually pretty straightforward because the more molecules in the path of the light, the less light can pass through the sample chamber into the filter. And this is called uh, the lambert bear law, which is an important law for spectroscopy. After the bandpass filter, there's the passive infrared sensor, which converts the remaining infrared into voltage. It consists of a very thin polar polarized crystal. Incoming remaining infrared is absorbed, and the crystal heats up basically with the same mechanism as the carbon dioxide molecule does, because the ions in the crystal will start vibrating. The change in temperature leads to a change in the polarization of the crystal, which can be measured as a change in the electric potential. So, conclusion. When the carbon dioxide concentration goes up, the infrared transmission goes down, the heat goes down and the electric potential goes down. When carbon dioxide concentration is low, the infrared transmission goes up, it, the crystal gets warmer and there's a higher electric potential. The next step is the sensor firmware, which converts the voltage, an analog signal, into a digital signal. <coughs> the carbon dioxide concentration is inversely proportionate to voltage and a conversion factor is previously obtained by calibration. But there are two things that have to be factored in. One is the temperature offset and the other one is humidity, where water again plays a role. The higher temperature leads to less carbon dioxide molecules being detected because heat leads to the expansion of the gas in the sample chamber and higher pressure inside will press molecules outside of the ch chamber. 
and the water content in the air is extremely variable, especially when there's a lot of people present or when weather is changing, when it's raining outside. Um, and water molecules basically dilute the sample. So to have values that can be comparable to others, we always need to have basically a dry sample. So the humidity is subtracted from that. So this is why the sensor has its own temperature sensor and a humidity sensor. Next step is we need to talk, the board needs to talk to the sensor and it does so through a protocol and the one I use is I squared C. I squared C consists of two signal lines. One is the serial data line and one is the serial clock line. And this is on a very abstract level what the signal looks like. This is basically voltage, high and low for each line. The clock goes just high and low pretty regularly, what you would expect from a clock. And the data goes up and down depending on what kind of bit is transmitted. And each signal package starts with a start byte and bit and ends with a stop bit. So the software I wrote sends these signals in, in the form of commands. And this is basically what a command looks like. The boxes in the lighter color we don't have to worry about because the crate that is used for this protocol does that for us. And the other ones you as a programmer have to do. You, have, you need an address and you need to know the commands which are usually to be found in data sheets of the devices you're talking to. And oftentimes you also need the so-called CRC bytes, which is a checksum. Because if you send a lot of data, you want to make sure it doesn't get corrupted. So I have three examples that I will also demonstrate later. We send this is basically what the command looks like for telling the sensor to start measuring. We send a write command to, this is the command part, this is the address, and sometimes arguments are used, which is true for this case. They're both zero and CRC bit, right? And this is just telling the sensor to start doing something. But sometimes we also need the sensor to talk back to us. Like in this case, we, this is a command to ask the sensor if data is ready. So there is an answer to be expected. This time I also show you the function that does this. We have a write buffer which needs two bytes, which are the commands you can see in the pink line. And we have a read buffer, which is the length of the answer we expect, which is three bytes. In this case, the answer can either, either be yes or no, so either data is ready or not. So the answer can be zero or one. In this case, it's one if data is ready. And when data is ready, we can tell the sensor to send the measurements, the data. And of course, here the answer is not just yes or no, but a lot of bytes for the data. So I will guide you I will give you a quick overview over the code and then demonstrate with a logic analyzer how the software talks to the sensor. 
Um, a logic analyzer is a device used for debugging embedded systems. It is hooked up to the signal lines and measures the voltage and basically takes a snapshot of the conversation between the board and the sensor. And I need a couple of seconds to set that up. Yeah, this is the code. This first part is about setting up the board and setting up the protocol. Then there is a delay for because the sensor needs time to power up. And the first command, which you remember, is start measuring. Then the program goes into a loop, which asks the sensor if data is ready. And if the answer to that is true, it breaks the loop and blinks green LEDs and goes into the next loop, which continues to measure carbon dioxide concentration, the temperature and the humidity and prints that out. And this is what I will show to you. So first have to start the debugger, which loads the program onto the microcontroller. And this is the software for the logic analyzer, which kind of has to be loaded and will just take a picture of the conversation once it's happening. And the first line I want to show you is the breakpoint at line 51. Got something. Okay. Okay. This is the output of the logic analyzer showing exactly the blocks I showed you before the address, the to the right head. Acknowledge the command and the arguments and the CRC bit. The next command is if uh, data is ready. What do you expect? Is data ready or not? <laughs> well, usually after this long time, of course, it's ready. So here's the one. <clears throat> and the last one is um, getting the measurement. And here we have all those bytes which are still not human readable, but this is the temperature, the carbon dioxide content of this room and the humidity in bytes, separated by CRC bytes. So we still don't have a human readable number, but
this is the thing I show you next. Um, I have to delete all the breakpoints. And now it continues in the measurement uh, mode loop. Except that the number is, to oh, well, it, it's <laughs> way higher than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> we have a carbon dioxide concentration of over 3,000 parts per million. And 1,000 parts per million is the concentration where you're supposed to open the window. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions to that, or? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the crystal that's uh, supposed to heat up is then uh, absorbing the same spectrum as the um, as carbon dioxide, or just like the, all of the spectrum? It would probably absorb all of the all of the spectrum, and the bandpass filter just passes the f uh, wavelengths that are absorbed. So. Yeah. And why, why do you need a chamber in the first place? Uh, could, could you do it without a chamber and, and have a uh, better flow of, of, of air through, through the, the, the center? And the, the well, the problem is that almost everything is an emitter for, um, for infrared light. So you would have a more um, distracting signals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how much does this whole thing cost? Um, the sensor costs about 50 euro, and the board is like 35. Okay. Yeah. Well, was like the, the entire tooling? Did it all work out, or was it a lot of? Uh, Error. <laughs> <laughs> it took me, it actually took me weeks to get that part, but um, this is the first uh, embedded rust project I did. And um, it was kind of frustrating because as you can basically see through this talk, um, embedded systems have so many layers and the rust code was the most easy thing in <laughs> yeah that was <laughs> it was kind of trivial the rust code was trivial but getting the th uh, all the parts working together with uh resistors and all the yeah d small details and that took quite a long time to figure out yeah would you recommend this as your as a good first embedded project or was it <laughs> um, depends on how how good your frustration uh, tolerance is okay. but let's say uh, if you have never done embedded stuff start with I don't know micro python yeah <laughs> no seriously let's and but then it's after that probably to totally cool Uh, that was, that is part of the crate. Yeah. Um, I, I know that uh, there are systems that's doing a lot of embedded stuff with Rust. I'm curious how you feel or maybe how the team feels the ecosystem is with Rust already embedded, uh, you know, embedded devices. Are you guys happy? Is there still a lot of, of work to do to make the ecosystem better? Or Um, my personal feeling is that it's kind of you have to expect to invest time because there might be a driver for your part or not 
Uh, in my case, there was a driver which wasn't working with the board, so I ended up driving, uh, writing my own driver anyway. So that's kind of what you have to expect. But yeah, you get to write drivers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I will uh, put a lot of carbon dioxide measuring devices in our office. <laughs> um, I will de uh, design these devices. They will have um, they have, will have an inter interface. They will have um, a display that will display these numbers, and they will send the data to a central Raspberry Pi, which will do nice data things with it. Cool. Yeah. <laughs>